Alistair, hello and welcome back to Rock and Roll English. Hello, Martin. It is wonderful to be here. Wonderful to have you. This is the second time you've been on the podcast, isn't it? Yes, I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how could you forget such a great experience of the first time? Hey, <laughs> it was it was wonderful. And I've been I've been waking up every morning thinking, I hope he invites me back one day. So I'm very happy to be here. I can only imagine. So I'm sure of all the 300 and 20 something episodes I've done. I'm sure your one is everyone's number one episode, but for maybe new listeners that haven't listened, um, just tell us something about you, what you do. It's English for curious minds, I believe, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I've got a podcast called English Learning for Curious Minds okay. um, that I started at the end of 2019. So it's, yeah, it's four and a bit years. And the, the idea is it's a podcast that allows intermediate to advanced English learners to uh, learn English while learning something interesting about the world. Absolutely fantastic. And you also have quite an interesting story because obviously you're from the UK. Where in particular are you from? It's a it's a good question that there should be a simple answer <laughs> okay. to, but kind of, kind of all over the place. I uh, grew up a bit in the south of England, then um, lived by Edinburgh, uh, but I've actually spent most of my life in London. Okay. Uh, right. Strangely okay. enough, it's where I went to university and then stayed for quite a long time. The... Never lived anywhere more than I've lived in London. Okay. But I'm not the... a Londoner. Okay. The the classic. And I think certainly when I talk to foreigners, um, the only foreigners I ever talk to really are Italians. When I When you talk about the UK, England, for them, it's just London. They don't... <laughs> but even my, my wife's family... They still say when we go there, they say, yeah, they, they live in London. And we say, no, we don't live in London. Mm -hmm. we, we live not far from London, but we don't live in London. But for them, it's just like you live in the UK. You could live in Manchester and then people would say, yeah, they live in, in London. London. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, but you actually live in Malta at the moment, yeah? I do, yes. Yeah. Not far from where you lived before in Sicily. Yeah, in fact, I, I often wanted to go to Malta, but I never actually got round to doing it. I'm quite fascinated by Malta, actually, because... So what is the official language? It's English and Maltese, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, there are two official languages, uh, English right. and Maltese. Yeah, because I remember, yeah, lots of Italians, and I, I'm going to Malta to, to learn English, and I was thinking... To learn English trade, you're going to go into Malta. And but really what that involved, generally these were obviously like teenagers, they were going on like a study holiday thing, and basically it just involved them spending a couple of weeks away from their parents, getting as drunk as possible and doing anything but learning English. <laughs> yeah, I think there are there are certainly people who fit into that category. And mm. I I can certainly understand because if I was a 16 year old and oh yeah i was trying to persuade my parents to send me somewhere fun for the summer uh, i would definitely tell them that i wanted to go and learn english in malta because that would be a very fun thing to do as a 16 year old It'd be much more fun than going to dundee or uh, <laughs> or, or somewhere like that and probably also cheaper so uh, i'm not surprised that it is such a popular destination for people like that yeah yeah when you think of it when people go to like yeah, places. I've heard some lots of random places in England people go to and you think, well, if you go to Malta. Um, but also, you're, is it right you're moving to Sweden? Is that right? Yes, uh, correct. I'm moving to Sweden in a couple of months. Cool. That, that's going to be quite a change. Are you, are you ready for this change? No, no, I'm <laughs> okay. not ready for it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not really sure what to expect. I've also never actually been to Sweden before. Okay, wow. Uh, that would be a bit of a, a bit of a change, but I'd never actually been to Malta before I came here either. Okay. So if that worked out, okay, that was seven years ago. Yeah. So we will see, uh, we'll see if I can, we'll see if it works quite the same. Going right. To yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, yeah, I wasn't ready to move back to the UK. And even now I still think, what, what was I doing? And I'm still not ready to live here. Um, but you, you just go with the flow. Um, and, Indeed. and you'll be fine. Which, so that term I just used, go with the flow, quite an idiomatic expression. And that's what we're doing today. So 
I have got some idiomatic expressions and the way this is going to work is so I will tell you the idiomatic expression and I will ask you for a definition. Now, this can be a really rough, terrible definition because we are not dictionaries. We don't have just this perfect dictionary knowledge. So it will just to give people some understanding. And then I have a chat GPT definition which we'll look at for a bit of a tighter one and then both share some kind of story anecdote related to this idiomatic expression okay yeah sounds good okay perfect so let's start with the first one up to scratch what what's your definition of that alistair i would say that up to scratch means meeting the expected standard level of something <laughs> For a minute, I thought you were literally reading that from chat GPT. You, I, you have your uh, mind uh, must uh, think I, I, in the I, I, same I way <laughs> you, you, you are chat GPT. So chat GPT is an actual person and it's Alistair because you got two key words there. So the chat GPT definition is meeting the required standard or expectation. That's the definition pretty much what you said if something or someone is up to scratch it means they meet the necessary criteria or are of satisfactory quality so i would say your definition was pretty good there so tell us something connected to your life where you this term comes to mind um well i, I was actually uh, i was actually thinking a bit more about um what you mentioned earlier moving to sweden and trying to make sure that i am prepared mentally and physically and linguistically as well because i was lucky to move to malta and not really have to learn any new language because english is an official language however sweden even though swedish people speak very good english is not quite the same um and i've really been trying to do as much as possible to get my swedish up to scratch um before arriving there so that includes listening to lots of podcasts trying to read some books, even getting stuck into some Swedish grammar, which is quite fun. Anyway, I'm trying to do as much as possible to get uh, my Swedish up to scratch. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I think it is actually used a lot in with languages, this expression. Um, but on that subject, a close friend of mine and regular guest on the podcast, Boom Boom Cannon, we call him, lives in Sweden. And okay. he, it took him a long time to get his... Swedish up to scratch. He said, I suffered this in Italy as well. I must admit the problem is it, it was worse there in some ways because everyone speaks English so well. So he said he was going into shops and trying to talk to people in his broken Swedish and they mm. would immediately switch. So yeah, he was talking to them in broken Swedish and they would immediately switch to English and just made him, he said it was very difficult to get through it. And like I said, I suffered that. And I actually think that is actually a really rude thing to do. If anyone talks to me in English, let's say in Italian, maybe they've yeah. got a very low English level. I don't switch to English because I just think that's, it's just a direct message to that person of your like language skills are terrible. So yeah. it's just such a harsh, horrible thing to do. What do you think? I, I agree and I'm exactly the same as you um, that sometimes if I'm in Italy speaking Italian and occasionally people will just say something in, in English and I will just continue in Italian because I, yeah, I, I don't like people doing that. I think it's not a fair thing to do, especially if someone's clearly trying to, trying to improve. I think yeah. it, it's, it's a bit different if someone is clearly struggling at a very low level. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, which I will probably be in, be in Sweden, um, but I think it's very different if someone is um, is at a higher level and wanting to speak that language. Yeah, yeah. If it's a situation where it's like a, if someone there's like a message that needs to be communicated and they're trying to talk to me maybe in broken English, I will say, "Do you want to speak Italian? Because I I can speak Italian. Like I I can help you basically. Mm. But if it's just someone like maybe a friend of like I don't know, my wife who just wants to try and practice English, I would never then just shut them down and be like, no, I'm not going to even try to speak to you in English because your English is terrible. I just think it's such a horrible thing to do. Um, I do. I do. But yeah. Well, yeah, well, well, I hope your Swedish is up to scratch. And what, how, what kind of level do you think you are? 
now it's still still pretty low right um, okay yeah it was so very I, difficult I, language to learn from what my friend told me yeah i think um some things are just refreshingly similar to english okay um like for example there's um uh, a phrase i heard the other day that i'm probably going to come in useful and if anyone is a swedish speaker and is <laughs> listening to this they'll please forgive my my pronunciation but it's something like lite madanka which is like let me think okay um so it's, i think you just much like um much like for people learning english you're you're getting your ears accustomed yeah, yeah. to the sound of things and and once you start learning to listen out for um but like how how swedish words might be similar to english words um because mm-hmm. they you know both have germanic roots then that's super helpful so my my level is still low but i am trying my best <laughs> okay good stuff um so for me this one's actually quite close to home so when i make podcasts and sometimes i'm listening to it maybe editing the podcast i always worry if the podcast is up to scratch and i think i i don't think i have actually ever done it but i often think i'm just very critical of myself i think we all are and i think oh like this this podcast is terrible shall i just like bin it and try to make a new one um because yeah i'm thinking this isn't up to scratch the uh, last week's episode was so much better for example uh, and it's just a, a constant fight i have with myself have you ever experienced mm-hmm. this with in the you're in the podcast game as well every day <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, so it, it's good to know I'm not the only one. Um, okay. So the next on the list is throw caution to the wind. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, I, I'm probably going to uh, come up with a bad definition here, but, uh, it probably means something like to do something a little bit risky without okay. fully considering the consequences. Yeah, I would say you've definitely got the keyword of the definition in there. Not bad. Um, So Mr. Chat says to act without considering the potential risks or consequences to take a bold and unrestrained approach, often involving risk or uncertainty. So yeah, I think the the first part of that is the clearest to act without considering the potential risks or consequences. So give us an example of a time that you have thrown caution to the wind. I think people will probably see a, a theme with everything I'm putting in here. But um, I was going to say that uh, I'm yeah, moving to Sweden in in a few months and I have never been there, but uh, I did exactly the same thing when moving to Malta. So uh, I thought I kind of threw caution to the wind when it came to just packing up and moving to a completely different country that I'd never been to. And I'm going to repeat that. Uh, and hope that it doesn't end in tragedy. <laughs> and I'm right in thinking you have one child or two children? Two. Okay, one two. When, when we first spoke and another one arrived after that. Okay, so yeah, very similar situation to me then. Um, so yeah, we moved back to the UK um, with one child and yeah, it, it definitely was a lot more difficult than when I moved to Italy by myself with a backpack um mm. moving back moving yeah. from italy here of literally we had to we actually hired a van to like drive here and oh my god yeah that's to be honest even though i sometimes think maybe i should move back to italy the thing i think that's stopping me is just the hassle of doing it again i'll just i'll prefer to be miserable for the rest of my life and die in england than uh and go through that again packing your life up into boxes and yeah. um dealing with relocation companies is uh, <laughs> it's not fun. yeah no i i've been there and my example is pretty much exactly the same things that we mentioned moving back to the uk now i didn't i knew like financially it was going to be difficult but we just threw caution to the wind and didn't really consider the consequences and said like sod it let's just do this um and yeah there there have been certainly times where thinking 
maybe it wasn't such a good idea to throw caution to the wind like we did um, mm. but I think we're sort of coming out of it now sort of two years later and another example I have of this again related to what we spoke about is having a second child because we did sort of think you know it's quite tough with one are we going to be okay and it was just like well let's throw caution to the wind and let's go for it not con- not really think about it just do it and again certainly times there thinking was that a good idea um so your your children must have a similar age gap what's the age gap between yours uh, one is about to be one and the other is four okay so a little bit better um so yeah i was about to be three and one exactly two years between them which okay the the main difficulty of this is the older one you, if you leave them alone for a little bit we'll be playing with a younger brother but generally playing might be sort of like putting a pillow over his face so he can't breathe um okay yeah <laughs> so yeah have you experienced any of this um not yet um no the the older one is quite sweet with the younger one okay but, I, but there probably will be a day when i come back and so there is a <laughs> pillow and uh you know jumping up and down and there or something like that but uh, the young one is just at the stage where, you know, everything his big brother does is just the best thing in the world. So even if he's jumping up and down on the bed, he's sort of laughing. And, right. And, but he probably embraced being suffocated by a pillar. <laughs> yeah, because you think, oh, I'll just go to the toilet. That'll be okay just for like one minute. And then you come back and then the older one's like lying on top of the younger one. And you're thinking... Mm. Yeah, maybe maybe it's not a good idea. I'll just bring them both to the toilet with me next time. Yeah. Um, but okay, so the next one, to fall by the wayside, what does that mean? Um, so I would guess the definition of that would be something like to, um, to stop doing something that you used to do or to stop focusing on something so that it becomes worse. Yeah, I would say your definition is actually better than chat GPT's this time. I must admit the standard of chat GPT's definitions has definitely gone down. It says here to fail or decline, to be abandoned or neglected. I'm not so sure about that. It says if someone falls by the wayside, they are unable to keep up or succeed and are left behind or forgotten. But I much prefer your example, like you're not able to maintain something that you were doing um so for example an example where you or someone fell by the wayside so i um uh, I, I studied languages uh, when i was at university and also spent quite a lot of time living in uh, in china and i really enjoyed learning mandarin i absolutely loved the sort of the difficulty of it i think some of the things that people that put people off like learning characters and tones and stuff like that i i thought they were one of the most enjoyable things just because they were so foreign compared to compared to english um and as i started to get more and more into mandarin i found that the languages i was meant to be studying yeah, in fact french and italian completely fell by the wayside because i just i just i was just far interested in other things and one of the things that i kind of took from that experience was the was how much easier it is to learn when you're actually really interested in something when you're kind of telling yourself little stories Mm. about why something is interesting and there's still i don't know like bizarre like very unusual characters or words in mandarin that i can remember now and this is going back 15 years um because they're just like so imprinted in my memory whereas you know the french especially because uh you know my uh, because my Italian is much better than my French that has certainly fallen by the wayside because I have no day-to-day need for it mm. um and I just focus on other things yeah this is what has always stopped me from learning another language well I'm worried that my Italian will fall by the wayside because if I think if I start learning Spanish or something and it it took me so long to get to a decent level in Italian I just think like I don't know and I think I certainly underestimated how difficult it is to get to a good standard in a language. I honestly remember when I was in Italy and I think I'd been there less than a week and I was talking to one of my friends at home 
who was the only one that had language learning experience, who funnily enough, um, was it like learn Mandarin actually. And I said, Oh, I'm just not getting anywhere with the language. And I remember he said, you've only been there five days. Like mm. what, what did you expect? And I think in my mind, I was thinking, well, you know, a month I'll be fluent. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think well, just, there's... yeah, yeah. I was going to say it was just, I think our British mentality of like, Oh, everyone speaks English. Like, it must be really easy to learn English. So I'll go there and it'll be really easy for me to learn Italian, but obviously that's not the case at all. Well, I think there's lots of people with them. Um, they probably make, make lots of money selling dreams of getting fluent <laughs> yeah. in, you know, a week or all those kind of things. There's one, there's uh, there's one specifically for Italians um, that someone told me about the other, other day, which is, I think it's called like, Metodo, metodo bambino or something like that like the okay. kind of kids method I, I probably got the name wrong um but that i think that was that claim to get you fluent in eight days or something like that Ooh, wow which <laughs> clip i've got no idea if it works or not but it seems that if it does work it should be the most successful thing in the world yeah exactly um, because I, I, I would love to know the trick to become fluent in eight days yeah i actually bought before i went to italy because i was trying to get my italian up to scratch i bought a um like audio thing but you listen to it and again the promise there was like fluent in a month or something so i thought well i'll be fluent by the time i go there then if i mm. if i listen to this cd um and i remember actually thinking when i went there i, I think i'll be okay here actually because i knew about 10 words mm. uh and then very quickly you realize yeah. it's like a very very hard punch in the face as soon as you get there and people start talking to you and you're like what the hell and you, are you, you can't saying start, you can't start a conversation by saying look these are my 10 words i appreciate <laughs> if you just keep keep the conversation with these 10 words yeah what well, a very early experience so this is my first time i've like moved to italy like, i'm on my own and i was i was on the bus and i had to basically ask someone where the bus stops and i, I basically so i not even in correct italian i basically said where stops bus mm. and I, I managed to get that message across and then she said a name which i, I recognized and i i thought i've already had a conversation like i am i've only been here 10 minutes like i am absolutely smashing it like this is it um mm. but yeah that, that was like the best conversation i had in like the first two years of probably when i was there <laughs> so well, that, now you've got an Italian wife, so the yeah. things, um, the, and you speak Italian with your wife. Yeah, although I do sometimes worry that when I talk to my wife, that you know, sometimes like with children, that sometimes you understand what they say, your children, but other mm. people don't. I do sometimes okay. still worry that I've just sort of developed this like language with my wife that she understands me, but if I talk to someone else, um. I do seem to get sometimes a, a few more sort of strange looks, but maybe that's just in my head. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I go to Italy, I, 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 I we went there for Christmas. I talked to her family, everything, no problems. Um, but yeah, obviously I'm still there short sometimes where they're still sometimes thinking, what the hell is he talking about? But um, mm. I, I, I managed to get by. Um, but for, for me, for to fall by the wayside, one thing I must say here, when for for years I thought this expression was to fall by the waste side, and I yeah. just always remember thinking, "What is the waste side?" To be honest, I don't even know why you you you've got a podcast about curious minds. Do you know why that where that expression comes from? Uh, I do not. I should have looked this up before, but I don't. I don't know where it comes from now. So that's your homework, everyone, to look that up. Okay, um, so. My story about this is when I went to university, so obviously before university you go to school and you generally know everyone and you know who the intelligent people in the class are and maybe let's say some of the more challenged students. And I remember going to university and it's, it's very much like, oh, like this is, everything's bigger and things. And so you meet the people like in your dormitory and stuff. And then when I had my first lecture, I, I, I studied economics for some reason and I went into this lecture and it, it was like, I mean, 
it was like I was going to a concert because it, there was just, it was enormous. And I remember looking around and it was absolutely full. I don't know the specific number, but for me, in my mind, it was like 10,000 people. I'm sure it wasn't that, I wasn't sure there weren't that many people. But then I remember like, as we went through the year, not even to like the second and third year, sort of six months down the line, lots of people, I think, fell by the wayside and just gave up because mm. it was like the whole university thing. I, I remember myself thinking, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to stick this out because it, it was all, it was all too much for me. How about you, your, your experience at university, like those first like few weeks, I mean, or a few months. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of people fell, fell by the wayside. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of like, I don't know, like some kind of maybe you're thinking who's going to come in on Monday morning. Oh no, he's, <laughs> he's, he's gone. Down. <laughs> yeah. We've, we've lost him. Soldier down. Yeah. But like adapting to new life. How, how was that for you to like, uh, did you move, change city? Cause that's the culture in the UK, isn't it? To like go to a new place. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I went to university in London. Oh yeah. Of and, course, yeah. Uh, London is clearly a bigger city in the country and has, I think, 10 or so universities. I mean, it, there are lots of different universities in, um, in London. So it, it doesn't really feel like a university city in the same way as smaller cities yeah, yeah. do that, you know, that are dominated by students. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've been to London lots of times before, so it didn't feel quite so unfamiliar, right? but still the experience of going in and seeing you know, huge lecture halls and that kind of stuff, it was, it was, um, it, it was really mind, mind boggling. Yeah, no, exactly the same for me. So, okay, let's do the last one now, which is to bite off more than you can chew. What does that mean? Uh, so I'm going to put on my chat GPT <laughs> to bite off more than you can chew. I would imagine means working or trying to do more than you are able to. Yeah, I think you should be able to. I actually, again, prefer yours. M more simple words, much better than Mr. Chat, which is to take on a task or responsibility that is too difficult or demanding to attempt something that exceeds your abilities or capacity. So, yeah, basically trying to do too much in simple words. So a time that you have bitten off more than you can chew. I think every day I feel like I'm <laughs> biting off more than I can chew. Um and I, I feel like I've got a bit better over the years in terms of planning my own life and, and kind of working commitments and so on. But I always find it a struggle if I'm trying to plan, you know, plan what I'm doing for the week. And I always find myself biting off more than I can chew. And at the end of the week thinking, I'm not going to do that next week. And Lo and behold, exactly the same thing happens. I think I've got to, you know, there are certain things I can do today. Thinking today, I'm talking to Martin. I've got to do X, Y, X, Y, and Z other things. And today is exactly the same as, as every other day in that I'm not going to manage to do everything that I want to do. Well, I'm very happy that uh, that we've had this conversation. So uh, we've, yeah, I've not bitten off more than I can chew in, in that respect. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm almost exactly the same as you almost every day. And yeah, you know, I think even as I mentioned, moving back to the UK with a child, then having a second child, that alone was biting off more than I can chew. Um, but then like working for myself as well in one of the most expensive countries, I think in the world, I'm not sure. And just to add to like everything I've got going on, I've recently actually got a new job as a lecturer at a university in London. Um, uh, congratulations. Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, and I don't know how I'm actually going to manage all of this. <laughs> By the time this podcast goes out, I, I hope to still be alive, actually. Um, because, yeah, I've, so I've got my rock and roll English stuff going on, two children, and what is essentially a full-time job. Um, but luckily, it's lots of working from home. So, um, yeah, I think I may have bitten off more than I can chew again. Um, and literally, in this exact moment, I'm looking at the clock thinking i need to go and pick up my daughter right now <laughs> because like you i'm trying to fit in too many things to my day again biting off more than i can choose so we are going to have to stop the podcast here but it's been wonderful talking to you alistair and just for people that don't know where can they find out more about you sure best place to start i guess is 
the English Learning for Curious Minds podcast. So yeah, uh, search on your podcast app or on YouTube, English Learning for Curious Minds. And uh, yeah, you can find out more there. Okay, excellent stuff. I'll put links to all of your stuff in the show notes anyway. Okay, so thanks a lot, Alistair, and we will see you soon. Thanks so much, Martin. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.